Uh, Romans chapter 8 in the very first verse, and it's kind of a lengthy reading, but I felt like we needed to, to uh, get the first 13 verses to get a full thought. Uh, Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Amen. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But... If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to be with thy people tonight. God, we thank you for each and every one that's here. We know that they're here by your divine appointment, nothing accidental, nothing perchance, and we give you the praise for that. God, we pray that you come down and that you would meet with us this evening and that you would manifest your word to us and that it might speak to our hearts. And if you do, Lord, we'll be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching really uh, uh, from verse 13, uh, where it says, uh, it, it, but if you, through the Spirit, do, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Now, a lot of times, uh, I see a lot of confusing sermons on this. I've seen this taken out of context by other denominations, and I've seen different things on this, but the base rule is this. Is this if you're not saved, you're still, an, uh, you're still obligated to the law. Mm -hmm. You must fulfill the law. Uh, you are subject to its uh, uh, punishments. And so uh, Paul goes uh, into a great detail of this, and I will point out where he is preaching to, where he is sending this letter, rather, is to the church at Rome. I personally believe that Rome was a defector. A lot of people say, well, I don't believe the Catholic Church. Well, I think some of her daughters from Rome at least did that. And even here, if you'll read Romans 1, Paul had concerns then. In fact, he, he talks about worshiping images as soon as he gets in to the text. And so the church at Rome had a lot of problems. And I believe what they were trying to work in grace is that you keep working, that you must fulfill the law. And then on the flip side of that, there's a great deal about the Holy Spirit in here. And when you have him, and when you do not, and I'm, you know, uh, that there is some confusion language, some confusing language about that too. Because a lot of people uh, feel like, well, you always have the Spirit. Well, David didn't. 
In fact, he cried out for him on numerous occasions when he did. And I'm not saying you can be lost again, but if we all say that, that we have the presence of God every day, all the time, you are a light. And, and so we find then that uh, Paul had some concerns about Rome and maybe their misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. So he begins to write a, a very pointed letter addressing that. He begins, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Now, to be in Christ Jesus is to be saved. Now, I believe, and Brother Keith probably can help me with this, I, I'm, I'm getting forgetful, but uh, I believe in Acts it says you are baptized into Christ, and, and the Church of Christ will run with that and, and teach a baptismal regeneration. I don't believe that. I believe when you're in Christ, that means you're saved. You're in the person of Christ. He died for you. It's an atonement thing and not a baptism thing. So what you have to ask yourself, are you in Christ? If you live to be 150, there's no greater, there's no greater question to contemplate. Are you really in Christ? And, and, and so we find then that he... Uh, he, he makes that very apparent, and notice the words, no condemnation. You're not condemned. You're not found guilty. Condemnation really is when the judge hands down the sentence, 50 years in jail, go to the gallows. And we are not condemned in that way on the merit of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now this is the portion a lot of people don't like and how grace has been mishandled. And we find that those that have no condemnation and or those that are in Christ walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Now walking after the Spirit is this, is following the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Now, when we get into this, let me say and qualify that, because I've had a lot of Pentecostal people that oppose me on this. He will never lead us anywhere against this book. Right. Right. Now, he'll lead us. Uh, I'm sure y'all's big uh, dream is newlyweds wasn't moving to Dover, Tennessee, but that was God's lead. You see what I'm saying? It's not always a pleasant thing to follow God but it will never leave you, lead you contrary to this book. And, and so that's the first thing. So you can mark her down if the Lord is leading you in somewhere contrary to the book, it's of another spirit. Remember, I think Paul was writing to the Thessalonican church, and he says, try the spirits. Well, how are you going to try them? Where are they leading you? Is it in harmony with the scriptures? That, that, that's how you can tell the difference. Listen, a, a false prophet, a false <coughs> devil will not lead you in tune with the scriptures. And, and, and so we find then that Paul makes this, uh, this clarification to the church at, at Rome and says, listen, if you're really in this condition, you'll walk after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made us free from the law of sin and death. Life in Christ Jesus. Now really twofold. Number one, genuinely saved. And then number two, how does your life follow the Lord Jesus Christ? That's a good barometer of where you're at this evening. Are you following the leadership of Christ? And he always does this by the Spirit. And listen, if you're not getting any information from the Spirit, from the Holy Ghost, you might ought to make a call in the election, sure, because it may be just you don't have what you think you did. You know what? And, and listen, sometimes it comes in rebuke. But you know what? After, after 40 years of being saved, I even welcome the rebuke because he's saying, Larry, you're mine. Amen. Uh, you're mine. I don't whip other people's children. I whip my own. Amen. And, and, and so we find then that we as the Lord's people need to uh, kind of look for that in our own lives. Verse 3, the Bible says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak 
through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness. Now, in my Bible, I do write in my Bible, and I have that underwritten likeness. Now, he, he took on flesh. Uh, he, he tried the flesh. But listen, he did not inherit, he did not inherit sin. That is the difference. He did not, because uh, if he did, if he, if he inheritantly received his genetics from Mary and from Joseph, he'd been guilty of sin. Amen. Immediately. Amen. Amen. Uh, because that's the sons of Adam, is it not? But we're talking about the son of the living God. And, and so that's why I was pointing out the likeness of sinful flesh because yes, he fought the battles that we did, but he didn't have that intrinsic bend towards sin that we do. And, and, and so we find that uh, as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, he reminds them that the law was weak, not in its edicts. It was weak because we couldn't follow it. We, we couldn't, we could not keep it. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I want you to see it also said that he came for sin. Now, that's an atonement. He came to pay for sin. He paid for my sin. He paid for all the redeemed down through the ages, all of God's elect. That was for them. He paid it. He, he, he wrote the note, paid in full. Verse 4, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Uh, excuse me, I want to read. Um, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. Now, again, this righteousness that, uh, that displays the very law of God, how do we accomplish that? And it's through the Spirit. You remember, uh, I think it was to the church at Corinth. He said, these do the works of the law that knoweth not the law. So what was happening, their, their obedience to the things of Christ, and they had never even heard of the law, the Gentile believers, because they were genuinely saved and because they were being led by the Spirit, did the very thing that the law contained. And that is what true salvation brings. Anything compared to that? You know what? If you can go out here and run around on your wife, and you can go out here and kill somebody and drink like a slot, something is wrong. It's terribly wrong. Because, see, we've been given what? The Spirit. And he, it ought to be where he whoops us up one side and down the other when we don't follow Amen. his truth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people, would, when, I, when I preach that, they look at uh, they like to have no idea what they're talking about. I had a woman tell me one time, I've always been saved. I'm like, no, most certainly you've not always been saved. You were born with an entity against God in every way. You were born as a God hater. And if Christ don't intervene, that's exactly how you'll die. And, you know, and she didn't like my comments very much. Uh, but I was right. And, and, and so we. We see then as the Lord's people, it becomes a barometer, a measuring stick of where we're at. Verse 5, for they that are after the flesh, good measuring stick, do mind the things of the flesh. So when we're looking out here across the country and the things that we have to do, places we have to go, what comes first? What does it mean when Bella's being good and she's be, and she minds me and her mother? What does that mean? If I say, Bella, hush, she hushes. And so, do you ever mind the flesh? I do. Flesh says, you go get this. You'll like this. Flesh says, you know what? You don't have to go to church tonight. Tell Larry you're sick. <laughs> You're minding the flesh. You're doing what the flesh says. 
And, and, and that's a wonderful spiritual barometer. Now, let me say, tell you this with that said, the more you mind the flesh, more you're bent to fleshly ways, the easier it gets. Similarly, the more you do that, the spirit is further and further and further away. And so we find then, as the Lord's people, that we need to recognize who are we minding, who are we being obedient to, who are we thinking about, who is directing us. But, but, they that, but they that are after the Spirit, capital S Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, these things of the Spirit, and to be carnally minded is death. Now, one, two things, it, it, this, this individual that constantly lives after the flesh and continually is obedient to the flesh, one or two things is at work. First of all, probably never converted to start with. Or, you'll see them pushing up Daisy somewhere. Because if they're really his, he'll take them out. And, and, and then you find these people that have lived in rebellion their entirety of their lives. I just have no confidence in them. And I'm not judging, but I do know this. God never violates his word. And he told us, that godly people will yield godly fruits. And it's not of their own self. Like I said of the Corinthian believers, it just popped out on them because they were following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's as simple as I know how to make it. That's the cusp of the whole chapter. If you're all fleshy, you're not pleasing God. If you're a believer and what you are is guided by vanity, guided by who you want to be, guided by what you want people to think of you, listen, that is just as much of the flesh as going out here and standing on the street corner and trying to pick up men. It's the exact same thing. <coughs> Right? And, and so that gives us to the situation, are we led by the Spirit, or are we led by what the Lord would have us to do, or are we led by our own desires? Now we immediately think a lot in a carnal mind that desires just our, our, our pride and jealousy and getting this and getting that, but no, no, no. Pride could be as simple as well, I've read the Bible 76 times. You know what? That, that's nothing more than pride. Just throwing that around and saying, look here what I've done. Now, I think he was a godly man. I think he's probably saved. There was probably a lot of points we would not get, we would not really do together now. But y'all all remember Jim Porter, fine man of God. I really, probably one of the most humble men I've ever met in my life. He read the Bible in its entirety every year. And the only reason I know that, he was going, man, I read, I read the whole thing every year. He was at your house, and um, he was thumbing through the Bible, and I said, you preparing for the night? He said, no, I'm just getting my private reading done. I said, oh, well, that's good. I said, how do you break it out? And he showed me, and it was on the front of his Bible, what to read. He read the entirety of the scriptures every year. And he said, I've done that since I was 15. And... That, and again, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't too good himself for him. Brother, Brother Jim just wasn't that way. Not at all. But he was being obedient. That, that quietness that he possessed is worth a thousand words. And honestly, if I hadn't asked him what he was doing, he probably never would have told anybody. And, and so we find then that we need to be very cautious of building up this thing in the pride. This flesh is a prideful, prideful entity. But ye, meaning the redeemed, meaning the saved, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, the barometer, 
if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now that's a question nobody asks and answer but you, but uh, does the Spirit of the Holy One dwell in you? Do the Holy Ghost give you leadership and direction? Because remember, this is what all our text is about, what the Spirit is doing in your life. Do you feel the keen leadership of the Holy Ghost? Be very difficult to answer, is it not? Uh, you know, it's easy to say, yes, amen. But is it real? Not just jumping on the boat because that's cool. Saying, yeah, he, he leads me. You know, I dare say you're like me. If I listen, he leads me all the time. But I don't. See, he's never going to lead, lead you towards sin. Now, the path toward his righteousness might be a hard one, and it might be stony, and it might be dangerous, but that's where he'll lead you. He'll never invite you uh, to worldliness. He'll never invite you to, uh, to carnality. He'll never invite you to pride. None of those things. He'll always put you in a in a situation that speaks of himself, not of you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we find then that as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, he gives them some, some key, some key uh, principles so that they might look at themselves. Because listen, this cannot be answered. And, and I really wonder if this was the beginning because what will happen to Roman Catholics is they'll ask the priest to be their barometer. And I believe one reason is because they don't know the Holy Ghost to start with. And so they don't have that internal barometer, so they turn to somebody else. Listen, don't put your spirituality in the hands of anyone. Amen. Not even me. Right. And, and so we find them that Paul was giving them very fair warning of something that he saw that could be coming. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, if, 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 and if Christ be in you, the body is dead. It is not as much as an oppressor. It's not that much of a challenge. It's easier to maintain. The, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, the living portion, and here to the believers, he said it should be the spirit. The living portion is the directive. Now, I've been around a lot of dead people in my years, and this is what I found with dead people. I have to move them. They don't move me. You see what I'm saying? So, we, what's dying is your flesh preeminent? Is your flesh the one and the pride and the filth that comes with it? Is it what's going on? Or rather, is it the humbleness and your care of lost souls? Which is guiding you? Which is the one that's in the lead? The flesh or the spirit? So Paul says if we are where we ought to be, the spirit is the one that's living. The spirit is the one that's guiding. And the flesh has died because huh, it's no longer nurtured. Now you think about your babies and uh, what you did to nurture them, right? And if you didn't nurture them, they get in a bad shape real quick, don't they? <laughs> you know, and, and I firmly believe this. Babies do better on breast milk because it's it's what God designed. And if you nurture your baby in that way, and sometimes it's not possible. I, I get that. But he nurtures us just that way. He will keep us close and intent as long as we're eating what he gives us. Now, once you get into if you've been a believer five or ten years, listen, you should have the cream way behind you. But uh, I see a lot of Christians that just still existing on milk, haven't you? 
And you know what? Those people are so easy to lose around, aren't they? So, so easy to get off track. And, and that is why. So I ask you, where are you at in this thing? Are you dead in the flesh or are you dead in the spirit? Verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he hath raised up Christ from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. In other words, spirituality impacts the flesh. And if that impact is not there, you might ought to be wary. You might, you might already be worried a little bit. Um, you know, I, I really am concerned about the leaders that don't follow that book, aren't you? See, when you follow that book, it impacts your life. Everything from, from getting up in the morning to going to bed at night, it impacts the whole life. And when it doesn't, listen, dear friend, something's horribly wrong. If you can wallow around sin and you've been saved 10, 15 years, something's just not right. And it's usually one or two things. They're not in the book or they've never been converted to start. It, it, it's one or the other. Because that book will nurture you. That book will bring you up. That book will make you strong. you got to get in it. Therefore, brethren... We are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, so we don't need to be living carnally. But if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. You cut your own throat. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Amen. So, you know, have you ever had one of those spiritually days where you feel like you're out of everything, there's nothing left to do, you're spiritually dead. And you know what? A lot of times that would be the worst day of your prayer life. And, that, and you know, uh, just like David said time and time again, there is no simple solution to that. Uh, Jesus, I'm sorry. You know, that just don't get the job done. We need to be truly repentant. What was John the Baptist's first sermon? Repentance. What was the Lord Jesus Christ's first sermon? Repentance. So that's what we, that's the place to start. So this evening, what's in control? Who has the leadership in your life? <clears throat> Does this old flesh, mine's about getting on the war side, 52 year old? Or does that inward man, according to the Bible, never ages? You know, and uh, you'll get this as you get older. But we've been talking about the trip to South America, and I'm chomping at the bit. But when I get down there in 110 degree weather, and my 50-year-old body is saying, why did you do this? <laughs> right? That, that, but the inward man should be still chomping at the bit. Yeah, my body's wearing out. But the inward man, and, and, and that's the paradox that we live in, is which one has dominion? Yes, this body's going to hurt. Yes, there's going to be pains. And yes, there's going to be difficulties. But you still have some zeal. You want to see the truth preached one more time. You want to meet with God's people one more time. You want to be you you want to be used of the Lord just one more time. That is your spiritual philosophy. Is your flesh leading or your spirit leading? That is the question. Only you can answer it. Uh, 